Hi all. Um, I hope you're uh, doing well, uh, healthy and uh, relatively happy, as happy as you can be. Uh, these are some uh, notes that I put together to go with the uh, posted notes, uh, notes 15 for Math 521. Um, I'm going to have a discussion at the beginning uh, of uh, just the tail end of the 14 notes and a computer demo that I had uh, set up that's already posted there. Uh, and then I'll go on to talk about the uh, 15, um, uh, the notes 15, uh, and how the multi grid ideas that we talked about um, uh, are implemented uh, for finite element methods. And then a last little discussion on. Uh, the significance of the uh, Euclidean norm of the residual uh, in the finite element uh, setting. Um, again, um, I hope you're all uh, doing well. Um, stay healthy, stay safe, uh, and um, we'll proceed uh, with uh, the posted notes and, and some accompanying videos and discussion. Uh, until they tell us uh, not to or the or the term ends. Okay, take care everyone. Material in notes 14. I'm going to take you through this uh, program uh, in MATLAB that's posted this MG1D. Um, and this is not an actual multi-grid implementation. This is a a computation of the full matrices that represent um, uh, multi-grid iterations. Uh, you can talk about the discretization level of the um, finest level grid. And this P is an optional thing where you can uh, specify the number of pre and post uh, smoothing uh, operations. Uh, so P equals 1 means it'll do uh, one um, weighted Jacobi iteration at the beginning and end of a, a coarse grid correction. Uh, and um, in here, uh, it uh, builds up the um, smoothing uh, and direct solve matrices at different levels. And it will build up the uh, two-level multigrid matrix. This is this matrix that uh, we derived in the notes, uh, which represents the how the um, error in iterations is multiplied from one iteration to the next. So you want this to have a matrix norm that is less than one. Uh, this is the three-grid method. So it'll smooth on the finest grid, um, transfer to a coarser grid, smooth there, uh, and then solve on an even coarser grid, and then come back down. These are describing V cycles, these matrices. And then M4 is, uh, is yet another level of um, transfer before uh, the direct solve is done. And so at uh, n is equal to 64, we can run this. Now we're going to end up with these three matrices. Of course, the interesting thing about these matrices is um, we could have analyzed these with uh, von Neumann analysis. Um, but, well, there you go. <laughs> it's um, it's uh, fairly um, gritty to do. Uh, and so this is just the numerical uh, version of that. Uh, and you can see on this um, on this um, 64 by 64 grid, we end up with, uh, hopefully, uh, 64 eigenvalues, although it doesn't look like it. Let's just have a look at this. Um, Let's do size of mg2 grid. Ah, okay, apparently I can tell it's 64 by 64 as much as I want, but this is a 
ends up being 32 by 32. Uh, I thought it didn't look like 64. Um, in the final assignment, uh, there will be a question uh, looking at uh, analytically deriving the um, eigenvalues of the coarse grid correction. And that's where you're going to see the, these two different behaviors between these two, two groups. You have some that are quite small and some that are a little bit bigger. What we're interested in, of course, is the, um, the L2 matrix norm of this iteration. Uh, and if I do that, I want to figure out the maximum of the absolute values of these uh, eigenvalues. Okay, something uh, that is quite small. You do one iteration and you're reducing the error roughly by a factor of, of 10. And on this same uh, level, I can look at the um, um, V cycles uh, with uh, further coarsening. Uh, and you can see um, this does an exact solve on the next coarser grid. Uh, and in these ones, the direct solve is delayed to even coarser grids. Uh, and you can see the convergence rate gets a little bit worse, but, but not much. Uh, and of course, the important thing is that um, this behavior does not change uh, in um, the level of the finest uh, grid refinement. So if we look at these guys, you can see they are not uh, changing uh, very much as you uh, refine the grid. Okay, so in fact, this is a iteration procedure which gives a very good error reduction um, in a operation that just is the same as the order of the unknown unknowns if the uh, matrix that you started with was was sparse okay so i think that gives you the uh, the feeling of how these iterations work uh, and um, i'll go on to um, uh, some of the lecture 15 notes i'll make some comments of those in a, in a, a few seconds Okay, so you've got the um, uh, the posted notes uh, 15. I'll just have a have a little bit of commentary on those. Uh, hopefully, they're straightforward. Uh, we're talking about uh, two things in these notes. The first one is uh, some of the details of how multigrid uh, is implemented uh, in um, finite element methods, um, and so. Uh, there's a there's a beautiful picture in the in the notes which I've, I've kind of uh, reproduced here. Uh, if you are in the situation uh, where uh, you are um, getting the finest level grid, that's the red grid in this picture, getting the final uh, the finest level grid uh, by refining. Uh, from a single coarsest grid. So that's the pencil in this little picture and in the notes, uh, which uh, if you refine once gives you the blue triangles. So that's um, you're refining by a factor of two, which in this two dimensional uh, problem uh, means that you're getting um, four triangles in the same um, uh, triangle that you started with at the course grid and then 16 once you get to the red level uh, and you notice that when you do this uh, there is some uh, regularity in the resulting grid that you get uh, and so in these kind of situations um, it's easy to talk about multi-grid as, as is described in the notes uh, but you also get some of the kind of asymptotic error results that we uh, had uh, for uniform uh, grids and finite difference methods. Uh, and so in the finite element, 
literature, those kind of results are often called uh, super superconvergence. Uh, I guess the sort of simplest one is if you are looking at grid refinement in something like this, uh, and you're testing against an exact solution to see convergence rates, you see uh, clean convergence rates, not like the kind of difficult to interpret uh, convergence rates like we saw with the irregular grids that you coded up in that 1D problem at the beginning of the term. Um, so if you um, have uh, such a fine level discretization, uh, then um, there, if you look at the bottom of, of page one, uh, there is a natural hierarchy of the finite element subspaces on those grids. Um, and if you do that, uh, you can define a natural uh, prolongation operator. See, this is what's shown on, uh, on page two of the notes. Um, so that is your um, prolongation, remember, is you're going from coarse grids to fine grids. So if you have a, um, a basis function on the... Um, on the pencil triangle, you can represent that as the sum of the basis functions of the um, in the in the four blue triangles, and so on. Okay, so you can use that to define a natural prolongation operator. Uh, and again, looking at page two, um, this is the opposite of what of what we did before. But then once you do that. Um, you can define the restriction operator as the prolongation operator transpose. Now there's a bit of a subtlety in here, uh, which is that um, if you look back at the kind of finite difference stuff we did before, there's a factor of two that shows up in the uh, restriction to prolongation uh, operator uh, matching, which doesn't show up here. Uh, and the reason is if you go through all the details, uh, the reason is remember that the finite element operators, the matrices A, they look like the finite difference operators but multiplied by H. And so um, there's already a factor of two built into the um, coarse grid operator and so uh, you 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 don't need that factor of two uh, when you look at the uh, relationship between the prolongation and the restriction operators. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, is um, that you can uh, define the um, coarse grid operator. Right At some point there is a coarse grid uh, where you need to do a direct solve uh, and um, at all sort of intermediate uh, levels, uh, you have to do some smoothing, you know, weighted uh, Jacobi iterations uh, at various grid levels. And those coarse grid operators can be um, uh, derived exactly in, in simple cases and approximately in other cases. Uh, from the fine grid operator using uh, these prolongation and restriction operators, and I and I show that this works in this in the sort of simple case of uh, of a stiffness matrix um, coming from a constant coefficient problem. Um, so I guess there's a couple of things. Um, what if your fine grid does not come? from uh, this kind of refinement of a coarsest grid at which you're going to do a direct solve? Um, well, then that's, that's an interesting question. Um, there are different strategies to use in that case. Um, the most general one is something called algebraic multigrid, where there is a technique where it looks at the fine grid matrix structure. And from that, without actually knowing, like, <laughs> any of the geometrical um, uh, connections between the elements, it just algebraically builds up something that it 
works out as a reasonable uh, coarse grid operator, and then so on. And those have been quite successful for these kind of kind of problems. Um, what's the other thing I wanted to say is um, if you thought of a kind of adaptive grid refinement, then you might have wanted to refine to the uh, red level in, in that, that the, the triangle that's there, uh, but that down below um, you um, d worked out by error estimation that you didn't have to refine uh, further in this blue triangle. And then you notice that um, right there at the little star that I've uh, put on there, uh, there is a what's called a hanging node in the in in the red triangles. Uh, there's no corresponding um, uh, uh, value on the on the blue side. Uh, those are called hanging nodes. Um, one of the topics, which at least is on the table for the end of term. Uh, is to talk about uh, discontinuous Galerkin finite element methods. Uh, so that gives you a way to handle that kind of um, mismatch between uh, grids and is actually much more general than just that. Um, and um, at some point I'm going to put out a poll, uh, which I guess we'll do online. Uh, I was going to just ask in class, but we'll do it online. Uh, to talk about the options uh, for the end of term material and and what what students in this particular year would uh, would prefer. Um, now, if you go on to um, the second half of of the fifteen notes, so starting at page four, um, there's this idea um, that you um, are, are going to use the uh, residual uh, as the, uh, an estimate, in some sense, of the error uh, that you are making in the um, in the solution of your uh, linear system. So, if you remember, okay, here you go. Here's my little my little uh, thing here. Uh, you're trying to solve uh, a linear system. A times u is equal to f, um, and you have an iteration where you are getting an approximate value of u, that's the um down below, uh, and um, while you can't measure the error directly, uh, we know, uh, and you can go back through the notes, this is something that just gets a little, uh, takes a little time to get used to, but um, the residual is always a times the error in the solution, so the error that you want is A inverse times this residual. This is this thing you can actually measure, right? You can take A times your approximation, subtract F. If it's zero, right, you have the exact solution. Uh, but of course, in general, you don't. And you want to uh, have a better understanding of uh, what the size of the residual, do, how, how, what that implies for the size of the error. Uh, and um, for many types of discretizations, it's not at all clear what that correspondence is. But for finite element methods, um, there is a kind of a nice connection, uh, which I, ex I explore in some notes. That's pages four to six. And if you go through those uh, uh, notes, um, and there's a detail which again is one of these things that's very hard to show in general for finite element discretizations. And so I show it uh, for um, uh, a simple 1D case, the kind that we've looked at before. Um, I show that you uh, get a handle on the error in the natural um, norm of the problem. That's that norm that comes from uh, the uh, bilinear form that comes from the weak form of the solution. You get a natural handle on the, uh, on the, on the error of the approximation transferred back to like the continuous function, how well that 
continuous function that the finite element method is giving you, um, how well that compares to the exact solution in, in that natural norm. Uh, you get a sort of handle on that through the Euclidean norm of the discrete residual. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of a nice result. Means you can really just compute the, the residual, take its Euclidean norm, and it has a relationship to uh, the natural norm of the, of the, of the problem. Um, so uh, those are the kind of key things to look for in the, um, uh, in the notes 15. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a discussion of the conjugate gradient uh, method. That's an alternative uh, iterative method uh, that's um, uh, successfully uh, used uh, for um, solving linear systems of the type that we've been getting uh, as discretizations of um, elliptic problems, finite difference and finite element. Uh, so you'll see how that works next time. Um, I'll end here. Um, you know that uh, at least tomorrow, that's it's Monday today, so tomorrow would be the day we would normally have a, a lecture. Um, I'm planning to be in my office. If you have questions, uh, we can set up uh, phone or Skype conversations if you have uh, things that you want to talk about that uh, we can't resolve by, by email. Uh, and um, until I see you in person, um, yeah, good luck out there. Uh, and um, if, unless this is a technical disaster, me putting this movie together, I'll do the same kind of thing uh, for notes for the rest of the term. Okay, best of luck.